Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you all as we celebrate Christmas. The title of today's message is, The Miracle is in Your Mouth. And before we get into this word, I want to just all bow our heads in prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank You so much, Father God, that You've made a way where there was no way. That You sent Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. And that there's no way to the Father but through Him. And God, that You're guiding wise men and women, children, Father God, down that path here today, Father. God, we pray right now, Father, that You would just take this church and give us eyes to see what You want us to see, ears to hear what Your Spirit is saying to Your church, and hearts to receive it. God, we humble ourselves and we come thankful. God, just like the wise men who came and bowed down and worshipped, and they gave Him their treasures. We come here today, Father God, thanking You, Lord God, for all that You've done for us, that You ascended on high and You gave good gifts to men. And so we thank You for these gifts, Lord God, and may they come back to You today as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto You, Father God. Lord God, and may our hearts just be ready for the moving of Your Spirit. Come and do what You want to do. Get me out of Your way completely. May these words be from Your throne room for Your people here today. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I heard a story a while back that I really like because I grew up around horses quite a bit. There were these three aspiring psychologists. One named William, another Julie, and the third one's name was Bubba. And it came time for their first test, and it was on emotional extremes. And so the professor asked William, he said, William, what is the opposite of sadness? And of course, William promptly replied, happiness, of course. And he said to Julie, what is the opposite of depression? And she said, joy. And then he looked at Bubba and he said, Bubba, tell me what is the opposite of woe, W-O-E. And Bubba got kind of a confused, puzzled look on his face and he paused for a little while and he said, well, I reckon it's giddy up. This time of year, we celebrate the greatest miracle that's ever happened. And I think the thing that can happen is that because there's so much of the world in Christmas that the church people even sometimes become super religious around this time of year. And even during this sermon, we're just waiting for a canned word that you've heard for the last however many years you've been in church. But God wants to actually move today. He sees the coming of His his Son as a time for the church to get especially on fire, not religious. And so here today, we get to celebrate the greatest miracle that ever happened. We're talking about this miracle, however, is also in your mouth. See, the greatest miracle that ever happened, the coming of God's Son, Emmanuel, God with us, began with a word that came from the mouth of Almighty God. But that word was then carried by the angel Gabriel to a young girl named Mary, and then he spoke that same word to her. And then ultimately, Mary made a confession of faith, and the word of God that had been spoken in heaven carried by Gabriel to her bedroom, and she spoke in faith and said, Let it be unto me, according to your word. How many of you all know that God wants to bless and do mighty miracles in this day and hour? Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I believe we are in a season where especially He wants to train and release miracles among and through His believing people. See, Mary spoke the miracle. The miracle began to be conceived when she believed and agreed with the Word of God that was spoken over her. See, the immaculate conception was preceded by her faith confession. And so here this morning, God's promises, He promised us us a powerful move of His Spirit. He says that His Word is a mighty weapon in the mouth of His people. Did you know that the Bible says that His Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? It's able to divide between spirit and soul, joint and marrow. 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This past week, we saw the passing of one of God's greatest generals. Some of you may have not heard of him, but some of you have, and the rest of you should have. And so I'm going to talk about him for a moment. Uh, Reverend Reinhard Bonnke. And he has a strange name because he was a German evangelist, but he was the Billy Graham of Africa. And God used him, listen, not to lead 70,000 souls to Christ, so that would be many, not even 700,000 souls, but in his lifetime, 70 million souls to Jesus. And God used him mightily that the gospel was seen through signs and wonders in his ministry, confirmed signs and wonders, even the dead being raised. It is chronicled. You may not believe it, but it's been recorded anyways. It's a fact whether people believe it or not. And multiple, multiple thousands of blind eyes open, deaf ears open, but beyond that, millions saved. But he began his ministry very small and very unsuccessful. He went around saying that I have a miracle-free ministry. Because in Africa there were all kinds of evangelists and preachers who were seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, but he wasn't. But the Lord told him, He said, I want you to step out in faith. And He showed him a stadium that was rather large, and He said, I want you to rent that. And, and Reinhardt thought, I can't get 30 people to come to my church. How am I going to get thousands of people to come to this stadium? The Lord said, rent it. And so he did, and he did in faith. And he invited this evangelist to come who had seen signs, wonders, miracles, healings. And so he advertised that this great evangelist would come. And it said on the sign, blind eyes will be opened, deaf ears will be opened, the lame will walk. And so people came in droves. And the first night the evangelist got up and he began to preach. And he preached a good sermon and then he walked off the platform. He never gave opportunity for anybody to get healed. No blind eyes were open. No deaf ears were opened. And Reinhardt thought, what are you doing? And he cornered him afterward, and he said, what are you doing? And the evangelist said, God told me to, to step down tonight. He said, advertise it again tomorrow. The Holy Spirit's going to move tomorrow night. So the next day, Reinhardt advertised again. He got the word out even more. This time, the place was packed out. And, and he got word that the evangelist decided that he was supposed to go somewhere else. And so the word had been spread everywhere. Blind eyes will be open, deaf ears open, miracles are going to happen, and the evangelist is nowhere to be found. Mind you, Reinhardt has had a miracle-free ministry for quite a few years now. And so he began to pray, and God said, when you walk in there, begin to declare that tonight, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and the lame will walk. That miracles will happen tonight. He had never seen this, but God said, declare it. And so he stepped up to the microphone, he welcomed everybody, and he said, miracles will happen here tonight. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. God is going to move, Jesus will save. And he preached a message and God had him begin to pray over the sick. And next thing they know, a miracle happens. A deaf person hears. They begin to declare what God has done. And the people come in droves. And miracle after miracle. And hundreds are saved that night. The miracle was in his mouth. He had to speak it before he saw it. He had to believe it and then receive it. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, the word beginning means the origins, was the Word. That word, Word, is capitalized because it's speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the beginning. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. Jesus was, and is, and always will be God. 
And He has become God made flesh. Look in verse 14. It says, And the Word, Jesus, became flesh. And He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word made flesh. But how did it happen? See, this wording here in John 1 is the same wording that's in Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning God did what? He created the heaven and the earth. But the Bible says that the earth was, was void and darkness was on the face of the deep. But then it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering on the face of the waters. And the angel Gabriel told Mary, he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And that which is conceived in you will be the Holy Son of God. It came through a word. Through the spoken word of God. And how did Mary respond to that word? In Luke 1.38 it says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The miracle began in her mouth, and the angel departed from her. Your miracle is in your mouth. Don't just say, I believe it, declare it. If you believe it, you'll say it. See, the Bible doesn't just say believe in order to be saved. You know, it also says to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people say, well, I believe. Have you confessed Him? Have you spoken it with your mouth in faith? See, we say, well, I believe that, that by His stripes I am healed. Well, then begin to declare it. Do you believe that you're free? Do you believe that you have victory? Do you believe that you've been delivered? Then the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Your miracle is in your mouth. You have been free, delivered, and set free in Jesus' name. See, the Bible says in Proverbs 18.21 that death and life are in the power of the tongue and that those who love it will eat its fruit. Your words are like seeds. And those seeds, when they're sown in time, will bear what? Fruit. And so your miracle is in your mouth and the seeds that you sow. And so don't just say, well, I believe. Begin to declare what God's Word says. Both, listen, your greatest mistakes and your greatest miracles will come from your own mouth. How many of you have made any mistakes that came from your mouth? Wives, don't look at your husbands. We already know. See, anything we go to do, there's going to be a word from heaven of life. But there's also going to be a word from the enemy of death. Adam preached a wonderful message through part of the Scripture about uh, David and Goliath a few weeks ago. And in that passage, when David began to walk towards Goliath, did Goliath begin to quote Scripture at him? Begin to bless him? No, he began to speak death over him. He said, what am I, a dog, that you come after me with sticks? He, 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 and he began to curse David, the Bible says, in the names of his gods. And he said, this day I'm going to feed your flesh of the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And see, at that moment, David could have shrunk in fear, couldn't he? He could have thought, well, you know, looking around and looking at him, looking at me, he's right. I need to get off of this field. But you know what he said? You come after me with sword and spear, but I come after you in the name of our Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He didn't quote what the enemy was saying. He quoted what his God was saying. And declared who His God was. And so here today, if you want to begin to release this miracle through your mouth called the promises of the Word of God, we must first of all stop speaking death. Stop repeating what the enemy is saying. 
See, we want to look now in the Christmas story at two people. One of them spoke death. One of them spoke life. One of them got in the way of their miracle. One got right in the way with their miracle. And the first one we want to talk about is a man named Zacharias. Turn in your Bible in Luke chapter 1 if you're not there already. Luke 1.18 The angel Gabriel that also would speak to Mary appeared first to a man named Zacharias. He was a priest. He served in God's temple. And it was his turn to uh, burn incense before the Lord. And of course, he had to go in all by himself to do this. And so he went in to burn incense. I'm sure he had done this hundreds, maybe thousands of times before. But this time was different. The glory of God filled the room. And an angel began to speak to him named Gabriel and began to declare to him that he would have a son, that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear a child and they would name him John and that he would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, that he would have the same spirit and anointing that Elijah had had. And and he began to declare this awesome word over Zacharias. And here Zacharias is hearing these words of life. These words of faith. These words of truth. And all the while in his mind, he's arguing with God. Let's be real. Have you ever sat under a good word and spent the whole time arguing with the word? Yeah. That's what we're talking about this morning. The miracle is going to be in our mouth. It says in verse 18, And Zacharias, look what he said. He said to the angel, How shall I know this? In other words, how could I possibly believe what you're saying? And he began to, instead of looking at the Word of God and what God had promised, began to look at his circumstances. And notice what he said. This is what comes out of his mouth. For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Instead of realizing our God is all-powerful, and with Him all things are possible, he looked at his circumstances. I think that we, especially in the Western world, we want to see God through a microscope. But if you could see God through a microscope, that would make Him smaller than you. He doesn't need to be proven. He is. And the fool has said in his heart, the Scripture says, that there is no God. He doesn't need proven. He needs us through common sense to realize that He is. He says in verse 19, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel. He is one of the archangels. This angel has spent who knows how long in the presence of God. He says, I stand in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you, and listen to this, to bring you these glad tidings. I had this great message for you. Sometimes I feel this way, by the way. I had this great message for you. And you just gave me this stink eye of the whole sermon. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. It's Christmas. Smile. It's all right. If you're saved, inform your face this morning. He came with this mighty miracle to give to Zacharias and Elizabeth. And all Zacharias can do is speak death. And how many of you all know that miracles, Mary's miracle began to be conceived by her confession of faith? And by Zechariah's confession of death, he's actually stepping into the way of what God's wanting to do. And so God gives something that could be seen as a punishment, but it's also a blessing. Remember what your mama used to say, if you can't say nothing good. And so God assures that, that Zacharias will stop speaking death. It says in verse 20, but behold, you will be mute. How many of y'all know for some of us and for me myself sometimes, I would be blessed if the Lord would just zip my tongue for a little while. (laughs) When I go off on a rant and all of a sudden I just find myself going... And he says, I know you think you're right, but think about what you're about ready to say to your wife. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand. He says, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak 
until the day these things take place. I'm going to get you out of the way until your miracle comes. Because you did not believe in my what? Words. Which will be fulfilled in their time. There's, there's a timing attached to God's promises. Very rarely does the word come and be fulfilled in the same moment. There's a walk of faith in between the giving of the word and the fulfillment of the word. And so through the process of time, Elizabeth, even though she's past childbearing years, is, she becomes pregnant. She carries John full term. And it comes the eighth day when all the Jews circumcise their children. And she was saying, his name is John. And everybody there said, what are you talking about? There's nobody in your whole family named John. Name him Zacharias after his father. And, and they're batting back this back and forth. And it says in verse 63 that Zacharias, he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote saying, his name is John. And so they all marveled. You notice what just happened? He just came in agreement with the Word of God. And notice what happens when he comes in agreement with what God said. Immediately, his mouth was opened. And his tongue was loosed. And notice what happens now. The man of doubt began what? Praising God. And you read on and he begins to prophesy. The man who didn't believe is now prophesying, speaking mighty words over John. And the man that he'll be. And then he begins to speak of the Messiah coming. And what will happen through the Christ. God loosed his tongue when he came in alignment with God's word over his life and over the life of John and the people around him. God wants to move through our words. See, when God... Listen, why was Zechariah in doubt? Because he, instead of looking to God as the source of all truth, was looking for evidence. When you look at the creation story, back to Genesis 1 again, listen, on the first day God said, let there be light. And what does it say? And there was light. Now that may not seem significant to you, but I want you to think about this. It wasn't until the fourth day that He said, let there be a sun for the day and moon and stars for the lesser light. God said, let there be light when there were no circumstances to predicate there being any light. And yet there was light. God is His own circumstances. His Word is backed by His character that He is God. He doesn't need evidence. When He says it, it is. And when is the church going to become a confessing church again? that believes that God is who He says He is and what He says He can deliver on. Jesus is the high priest, the Bible says, of the confession of our faith. And I ask you this morning, does your high priest have any confessions from your mouth they even work with? We are called the confessing church for a reason. And where is the confession in the church today? The church today nitpicks itself to no end. We have become the people. You look up on this screen. If I were to turn that screen absolutely white and put one black dot on it, you know what every single person in this room would do? You wouldn't see any of the white. You know what you'd be doing? And the church today wants to nitpick its own self. It wants to nitpick its own ministry. I'm going to be real this morning. Stop focusing on the one or two bad things or the one or two bad apples in the church. Get your eyes back on Jesus and all the good stuff. Because Jesus said that His blood would wash us white as snow. He takes that black dot and He erases it. Woo! Oh. Yeah, that's why the Bible says in Psalm 141, 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Lord, if muzzle this thing for me. 
It was a blessing that God muzzled Zacharias. It got him out of the way so God could have his way. He says, keep watch over the door of my lips. Don't talk yourself out of your miracle. Begin talking yourself into it. Don't speak death over your life. Begin to repeat what God is saying and speak life over your life and the people around you. See, Goliath began to curse David. And I ask you, church, what is your giant saying to you this morning? What has your giant been speaking over you? And what kind of death? Listen, you know he even tries to make assignments over churches. He, he'll, he'll, he'll create one bad apple, one problem. And you know what he wants to do? Tell the church, that's where the church is going now. I'm preaching for somebody this morning. If you're looking for the perfect church, if you find it, please leave immediately. What's your enemy been trying to get you to repeat about you and about the people around you? In James chapter 3, verse 6, he says, The tongue is a fire, and it's a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members, our body parts, that it defiles the entire body. And it sets on fire the course of nature. The course of nature is referring to our entire lives and the lives of those we come in contact with. Where does it come from? And it's set on fire by hell. Words of death and destruction and evil and gossip, they come from hell. See, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're seeking for heaven on earth when we pray. But how many of you know the enemy is also speaking words because he wants to unleash hell on earth? And he wants to do it by of all people through the people of God. Because we have been the ones who have been given the authority to speak and declare, to bind and loose. And He wants to take the people who've been given the authority to bind and loose. I'm going to preach this morning. And get them with the authority, because the enemy doesn't have it. It's the church. And get those with authority to stop repeating what heaven is saying and to be declared to declare what the enemy is saying. And therefore short-circuit the move of God and the miracle of God. See, hell is trying to sow lies into us. It's trying to sow deceit into us. Trying to sow deception and hatred into us, isn't it? Trying to sow all these things into us, all this poison into our lives, into our families, into our churches, into our communities. Meanwhile, heaven is speaking a word of life over us. God is saying, I came that they might have life. And have it more abundantly. God is speaking a word of courage over you. A word of blessing. A word of promotion over you. He's saying, I want to bless you and use you and promote you and send you and empower you. He's speaking words of life this morning. He says, I've given you dreams and a destiny. I've given you purpose and power. And nothing that the enemy says can stop it. Get in line with God. Talk yourself into what God is saying. Speak yourself into what His Word has declared. Stop speaking death. Stop. And begin speaking life. Begin to speak life, church. Six months after Gabriel visited Zacharias, And Zacharias' word of death. The same angel comes to Mary with a word. And he begins to speak a word that's even crazier. And has much less evidence even yet. 
that this little girl, young lady, poor nobody, that she's going to give birth to a son named Jesus, that He will be the Son of the Most High God, and that He will save His people from their sins. And, and there's no evidence of this. There's, but how does she respond? She just says, how are you going to do this since I've never been with a man? She didn't say, are you going to do this? She's just like, well, how's that going to happen, by the way? And the angel says, I'm glad you asked. And it says in verse 35, Luke 1, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One is to be born will be called the Son of God. The same Holy Spirit that hovered on the waters in Genesis 1-2 when the earth was dark and void and darkness was on the face of the deep, that same Holy Spirit who fulfilled that word will fulfill this word in you. In verse 36, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. See, the enemy had labeled her barren, had labeled her womb dead. But how many of you all know that the promise in the Word of God cancels the assignment of the enemy? Jesus, the Bible says, Cursed is he who hangs on the tree. The curse of the law Listen, has been broken over you through the precious blood of the Lamb, washed away. Somebody needs to hear this. Just because dad did it, mom did it, grandpa did it, doesn't mean you have to. It's been canceled. The blood of Jesus cancels it, washes you white as snow. Somebody need to hear that this morning. You are blessed by the blood of the Lamb of God. Verse 37, he says, For with God. Nothing will be impossible. And I just see this church coming into a year where nothing is impossible. Hallelujah. I see this church coming into a year, I declare by faith, where all limits are blown off. All boundaries of the enemy removed. Oh. And so, verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to... Your word. And the angel departed from her. See, Mary's confession led to the conception of her miracle. At that moment, she opened her heart for the Word of God to get sown inside of her. And that every word that God had spoken of her began to be released. And the Holy Spirit came upon her. Do you know why it's important to be in the presence of God in a Spirit-filled church? Because that's where God creates. You want to be in a place where the Spirit of God hovers. And people, listen, who are hungry for God come. And when they're in the presence, you know what happens? Seeds are sown in you. You become pregnant with His promises in the presence. Why is it the enemy is trying to cause churches today to stop reverencing the presence? We're in such a hurry nowadays. Because He knows that if He can keep us from getting intimate with the presence of God, that seeds cannot be sown and conceived in our lives. And so I just want to decree and also declare a year for cornerstone of intimacy with the Almighty. Intimacy with the Almighty, that seeds would be sown in us. If you look in your Bibles in Mark chapter 11, I just want to tie something here together. It says in verse 22, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Stop looking at what's going on around you, what other people are doing, listening to what other people are saying, and get your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Because faith is what? It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things you haven't even seen yet. I haven't seen it, but God said it, and I believe it, and I declare it. 
All the promises of God in Him are yes and in Him. Amen to the glory of God through us. Jesus says it. Jesus declares it. And we say it and come in agreement with it. He says in verse 23, For assuredly, you can take this to the bank. Assuredly, most certainly I say to you, whoever, I underline this word, says to this mountain, what is your Goliath this morning? What is screaming at you? Intimidating you? Trying to trash talk you? Trying to tear you down? Is there a sin in your life that just keeps hitting you? Is there a struggle that you keep facing? Is it something somebody said about you and hurt you? Maybe it was even church people. Maybe, listen, maybe there's a sickness or a disease and the enemy's trying to apply it to you and say you can never get past this. Maybe it's depression or oppression. Say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. And does not what doubt or waver in his heart, but believes those saints he what says will be done. Says will be done. He will have whatever he what? In one verse, he says believes once, but says three times. Because listen... The seed is sown in your heart, but it comes to fruition through your mouth. And so he asks, listen, so many Christians, oh, I believe, like little scared mice. How many of you have ever seen Jesus deal with the enemy in anything other than utter boldness? When God speaks a word over you, when you see His promises over you in Scripture... Don't be intimidated anymore. Step up in faith and boldness and declare, this is who God says I am. And begin to tell the enemy, this is who my God is. And this is who God, my God says that I am. And this is what He says He has for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But what if nothing changes right then and there, Pastor? Well, that's why verse 24 is there. Sometimes you will declare and declare and nothing in the natural changes. God said, let there be light and there was light, but there wasn't a sun, moon, or stars for four more days. It says in verse 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, when you pray, believe then that you receive them. And you will, and the Scriptures indicate a gap of time, have them. How many of y'all know that the world says, I'll believe it when I... But the church says, I'll see it when I believe it. When God gave Mary the Word, did she say, well, I'll believe it in nine months? When did she believe God's Word? Right then. She believed that she had received. And therefore, the seed of the Word was sown in her womb. And she became pregnant with God's promise. And she carried that promise until the Christ was born. And then she spent that time with Him during those 33 years even, with that promise that God had spoken over her and over her son. Is this talking to somebody this morning? Have the faith that you have already received whatever you prayed for. And whatever you prayed for is yours. All there is, is now just a matter of time. It's not if anymore. It's only when. Some of you all need to hear this because, listen, I think there's a lot, i got to say this, there's been a lot of promises aborted along the way because they didn't come when we wanted them to. You remember the angel even said to Zacharias, the promise will be fulfilled at the appointed time. You have an appointment with God. You have an appointment with His promises. You have an appointment with His blessings. You have an appointment with His Word over you and who He says you are and what He created you to be. And I'm telling you this morning, don't stop along the way. Don't abort the promise along the way. Press on through until you see the promise come through. Oh, 
What does it say in 2 Corinthians 4.13? I love this. We have the same spirit of faith. Do you have the spirit of faith this morning? According to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. According to the Word of God, if I believe it, I'll declare it. If I believe it, I'll say it. And I just, I just feel it off this from you all. It's like the enemy's trying to clamp your jaws. It's like he's trying to shut you up. He's like he's trying to pour a wet blanket on this Word. I can, can you all sense that? You know the enemy only fights what he disagrees with. He is trying to keep you out of God's promises. He's trying to keep this church out of God's destiny for it. He knows the words are signed over you. He knows the word of God over your life. He knows the words of prophecies over this church. And he's doing everything he can to stop it. And I'm saying this morning to Cornerstone, will you just let a preacher declare the truth? Or will you stand up and be the church? Because I can't fulfill God's promise for you. You have to receive it for yourself. I can't fulfill God's word over Cornerstone. You have to receive it. You have to speak it. See, this church has been waiting for the preacher to get a little on fire so you can get a little hotter. But God's saying, i got a fire to light in you. i got a word to speak over you. i got a promise to fulfill in you. i got something to do in you that you're going to be so caught up in. You won't be worried about what this preacher says or what somebody else did. You'll be saying, look what God's done to me. Look how He's blessed me. Look how He delivered me. Come on, church. Today is the day and now is the time for the church to begin to declare the promises of God. David said in Psalm 91, I will say of the Lord, He is my rock and my refuge, my God in whom I will trust. Come on. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside. Listen, listen, church. In Psalm 1914, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my strength and my redeemer. What the Lord wants to do with this church today is this. He wants to take your heart and your head and your mouth and get them all going in the same direction. Your head going in the same direction as your confession. Your heart going in the same direction as your confession. He wants you to know it and speak it and believe it. We believe, therefore we speak. Romans 10.10, one more scripture. It says, for with the heart one believes. It comes from deep down inside. It's because that word of God has been sown down in our heart. We believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Do you believe in your heart? And see, the word salvation isn't just only talking about the forgiveness of sins. It literally means to rescue you or deliver you. And it speaks of wholeness. It's your rescuer who delivers you out of situations. He's your rescuer who gets you out of addictions. He's your rescuer who lifts you up out of depression. He's your rescuer who heals your body and your mind. He's your rescuer who sets you free from every bondage the enemy has tried to assign to your life. How does it come? When we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. And the moment we come to that place, faith is released. Faith in God. Faith in His Word. And Almighty God begins to move to fulfill His Word. You know, the Bible says that the Word of God is like silver refined in His furnace seven times over. Do you know that the Bible says that God has honored His Word above all, even His name? 
Our God cannot lie. And so he says, I put behind my word all that I am and all, all, that, I, all that I can do. And he's all powerful and he's all trustworthy. That's how sure the word of God and the promises of God are. Listen, church. Whew. I want to speak one more word over this church. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. I don't know why, but we need to go there. I'm not going to read the passage. But in the passage, the prophet Ezekiel is lifted into a valley. Most of you heard this Scripture many times, but he sees a valley full of bones and says there's many, many bones. I ask our worship team to come forward and display softly, but they're not only many, many bones, but it says that they were very dry. And he's looking at this situation. And God doesn't declare what he's going to do. He asks Ezekiel to do something. The word came forth this morning about faith without works is dead. We want to move, and so God is saying, well then, move. Hey. And so what does He say to Ezekiel? He asks him a question. Son of man, can these bones live? And the interesting thing is the bones are not the world. They're not the people out in the world. He says, this is the house of God. And I believe all through the house of God today, there are those who are struggling, us who are broken, us who are very dry, us who are discouraged, us who have been oppressed, that the enemy has been trying to beat on you with lies just like Goliath tried to spew evil all over David. And that, that giant's been just in your face. And he's been waving any kind of evidence he can to try to say that what he's saying is true and what God said about you is a lie. And so God says to Ezekiel, He says, Son of man, I want you to prophesy over these bones that they would breathe. And the word breath is the same word for a Holy Spirit. That breath would enter them and they shall live. And so he spoke a word over the dry bones that the breath would enter them and they would live. And the Bible says that the bones began to rattle. And finally they began to come together, bone to bone, sinew to sinew, flesh upon those bones. And they began to stand up. And he had prophesied though to the breath that would enter them. And they stood up, but you know what the Bible says? They still had no breath. And I think so often in the church today, that's where we stop. We think, well, look around you this morning. A lot of seats are full. That's the fulfillment of the Word. See, they had a body now, but no spirit and no breath. And the church in America today thinks that revival is big buildings with lots of people. But I'm here to say that revival is a church and a community saturated with the glory of the presence of Almighty God. I'm not looking to be the biggest. I want the most of Him. That's revival. Stop looking for circumstances. Stop looking for people and look to Him. Be hungry and thirsty for Him. People ask me, how do you get revival? Get on your face. Die to yourself. Cry out unto Him. Become undignified. And so one more time, as He looked across the valley full of bodies formed, but they had no Holy Spirit. They had no life. They had no victory. They had no presence. And He prophesied over the breath. He says, wind of God, come from the north. 
Wind of God, come from the south. Wind of God, come from the east. Wind of God, come from the west. Come and blow. Come and blow. Come and blow on these bones that they might live. And they stood up in exceedingly great army. Hey, it's time, church. Let's rise this morning. Stand up. Become the army of God. God here today. These altars are open. Jesus said that his words were spirit and life. Spirit and life. And God here today is wanting to speak over each person here in the mighty name of Jesus and prophesy over you. You shall live. You shall not die. And God will fulfill his word over your life. I begin to prophesy over Cornerstone that this church will live and go on to all that God has for it. I begin to speak life over you. I begin to speak life over our city. I begin to speak life over our city hall. I begin to speak life. Listen, over our schools, over our administrators. I speak life over this community. I speak life over every home and family. I speak life. Will you, church? Church today, these altars are open to come release the miracle that's in your mouth. I can't release your miracle for you this morning. It's there in you. And God is saying, will you speak in faith? Will you believe? And will you receive? In Jesus' name, amen.